Thanks, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. It's a couple minutes after nine. We may have some others joining late, but we'll go ahead and get started uh, uh, with our meeting today. Uh, thanks so much for uh, joining us for the Government Affairs Committee meeting uh, today. Today, we have a couple of guest speakers. Um, David, would you like to introduce our speakers? And we'll go ahead and let them get started. All right. Um, our uh, uh, program today, we're going to be talking about 911 and the emergency uh, services in the village area and uh, to educate us about that are uh, village uh, fire chief Jim Miller and Jason, uh, Jason, Jason Miller. Jason, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And um, from LifeNet, Mr. Ronnie Weaver. And I'll let them start. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, one of the things that, you know, that is we've struggled with since the very beginning of life that out here is to uh, educate the public on uh, the operations of life net and how uh, uh, we're contracted through the PLA and, and how the residents are uh, privileged uh, to have uh, basically a, a membership program uh, so uh, there's been a lot of confusion with the different services that have been out here, starting with Cedar Mountain Ambulance Service and all that, how people uh, were able to uh, pay for their, uh, their ambulance service. And uh, the village is very unique uh, because it is... You might have me speak up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Use the microphone a little more. Yeah. Is this better? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Anyway, the village is very unique because it is uh, very geographically uh, spread out and, and can be a nightmare at times uh, geogra geographically navigating uh, here in the village. Not because we don't have the technology to, it's just that there's uh, uh, so much distance in between. But anyway, what I'd like to do, I, I, I give you all some information just as references and stuff for, for yourselves. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our, our company and our history and then go into our services here in the village. And for those of you that are on the Zoom meeting, we'll get an electronic copy of this and then we can send it off to you as well. So, uh, first of all, LifeNet is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we're governed by a board of directors. Uh, before the village, we uh, had a nine-chair board of directors and uh, our home base is in Texarkana on Arkansas and the Texas side. And we uh, found out real quick that the majority of our, direct, our board of directors was from the Texarkana area. So as we spread out a little bit, we wanted to make sure that we had representation from all of our service areas. And here for the village, uh, Harv Shelton, Harv Shelton sits on our board of directors. Uh, and he has been an extremely valuable asset uh, as far as helping us govern our operations. Uh, they're, very, they're all made up of civic-minded uh, directors. Uh, most of them are either hospital CEOs or some form of a corporate type CEO, uh, extremely civic-minded. Uh, each one of our divisions, and we have four our, we have four operational divisions right now. And each we have represented representation from all of, all of those areas. Uh, our, our key management is David Bumgarner, who is our CEO. Uh, and then we have a general ma manager, which is Jason Gardner, who is here in Garland County in our administrative office at the uh, Regions Bank downtown, the old Regions Bank downtown on the fifth floor. <coughs> and then for Hot Springs itself is one division, Village, Hot Springs Village, Hot Village, Hot Springs, Garland County, Malvern, and Lockman Air too. Uh, that is our division, even though we all have four separate departments in there. Each one of those departments has a director of, of operation that works underneath the general manager, and underneath the director of operations in each one of those divisions, there is operation managers, there's shift supervisors, that basically control daily operations for the crews and uh, operations of 911 services during that period of time. In uh, Hot Springs, uh, 
the call volume is extremely high. So we have uh, 12 hour trucks. Uh, they work 12 hours, nine hours, 14 hour shifts. Uh, we took away the 24 hour, 48 off on that because of the load that it was putting on our medics because of call volume. Uh, here in Hot Springs Village, we still work 24 hours on, 48 off. In Melbourne, we work 24 on, 48 off, and our helicopter crew uh, works 24 on, 48 off. Uh, my main responsibility is Hot Springs Village and also the air program. Uh, again, uh, I've been doing this for 40 years. I started with St. Joseph, or actually started here in the village, then went to St. Joseph's, the Mercy System. Did 25 years with that. And then during Medicare reform, uh, the hospitals were running the ambulance service in Garland County National Park and, and uh, St. Joseph's. And they found out very quickly that financially they could not operate a, 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 you know, a service of, uh, of the size. So uh, they invited LifeNet from Texas Canada to come down and LifeNet ended up uh, purchasing all the assets and retaining all the employees and taking over services um, in uh, 2005. A real history about LifeNet, it actually essentially started in 1983 uh, we were the very first air program in the state of Arkansas and Northeast Texas. Uh, we've been operating since 1983 with a helicopter and over 30 years we have flown completely accident mission free, uh, which we're very proud of. Uh, we uh, have a partnership with Air Methods, which is one of the largest uh, air providers in the uh, nation right now that's got over 540 something bases across the United States, also 80s and in Alaska and Hawaii. Uh, in 1993, Wadley Hospital and Christus St. Michael's was running the ambulance services together in uh, Northeast Texas in uh, the Arkansas side of Texas County and Miller County. And again, uh, being a hospital based ambulance service financially, they just weren't able to uh, maintain uh, you know, their commitment. So they developed a not for profit organization, which now is like the EMS. Uh, and that started in 1993. In 2005, they moved to Hot Springs. And in 2009, we took over operations here in Hot Springs Village. In 2011, uh, we opened operations in Western Payne County and Stillwater, Oklahoma. We also run EMS for uh, Oklahoma State University there. Uh, we started that program in 2013, and in 2014, we took over Malvern and Hot Springs County. Uh, and just uh, in 2019, we took over Denison, which is by Lake Texoma. Uh, we run a uh, four ambulance uh, service there. It's very similar to the village. And just recently, in the last couple of months, we took over Morris County, Texas, which is also in the northeastern portion of Texas. So we've gotten fairly spread out and large. We uh, probably, as an organization, we have over 500 and something employees. Uh, we run approximately 75 to 80,000 uh, responses a year uh, as an organization. Uh, here in Hot Springs Village, we, uh, we have about 4,000 uh, response a year annually. Now, that doesn't mean those are all transported patients, but we do have that type of response and that type of volume. One of the biggest things that we're proud of is that uh, we hold the gold standard for accreditation uh, throughout the nation, uh, which is called a CAS accreditation. And it's uh, the gold standard for medical transport and they check over a hundred different standards and we are currently audited every three years. Uh, they send a team down and it's a third party team that the nation, you know, that's developed by the nation and they come in and look at every aspect of our operations uh, from agency management, financial management, strategic planning, public relations, mutual aid and disaster, our community education, our human resources, and basically our clinical standards and quality improvement. We're one of eight services in the state of Arkansas that hold this accreditation and only one of 80 in the nation. 
So we're extremely proud of that. It is uh, uh, pretty much, uh, they check every I is dotted and every T is crossed and that we're meeting those standards. Uh, so what happens when you call 911 here in the village? Uh, you're going to get free rival instructions. Uh, we use electronic uh, uh, emergency dispatch. Every one of our dispatchers are nationally certified emergency medical dispatchers. Uh, as well as as EMTs. Huh? Now, also, when you call 911 here in Hot Springs Village, you're, you're connected if you're on a landline or even through a tower. You're connected to the dispatch at the police department. Once that, the, once the uh, dispatcher at the police department identifies the nature of the call, if it's a medical response needed, it is uh, transferred down to LiveNet to their 911 call center. Their call center is now at the Garland County, the old Garland County Sheriff's Office, which is a countywide dispatch center. Uh, are y'all y'all are attached to that, right? No, we're not. No, you're not. Okay, sorry. Now go ahead. Anyway. There's basically just like Chief Miller said, there is four primary 911 dispatch centers in the, in in our region, and it's the Arkansas State Police, Hot Springs City Police, Hot Springs Village Police, and the Hot Springs uh, Fire Department. If you dial 911, depending on what who your cell provider is, it depends on where your location is to what tower you will hit. But you're basically going to get one of those primary peace apps. A 911 dispatcher, and they're basically going to ask you three questions. What is your emergency? <laughs> Law enforcement, fire, or EMS? And once they identify which one of those agencies you need, it is a one button transfer to that comm center. Which, if you call 911 here in the village, you're going to get the village police department. They're going to do a one button transfer right over to our dispatch. And you immediately start talking to one of our communication operation operators. Uh, a lot of the confusion out here in the village, and that's one of the complaints that I get. I'm sure Chief Miller gets, even the police department gets. When you call on one, you know, people get frustrated with all the questions. Uh, but the, what what they de need to realize is that it is a very multifunctional communication center. You're not. Even though you're talking to one person and one person is gathering information from you, there's another dispatcher already dispatching an ambulance and talking to a crew. Uh, so even though you feel like you're they're they're not responding and they're not answering your or you know they're not moving fast enough, that process is already in play by a secondary dispatcher or even a third dispatcher. Uh, based on the information, why it is so important for us to ask those questions, since we do use EMD, which is a national standard uh, dispatch system, as you answer questions, it dictates the priority of response of what type of response you're going to get by your ambulance service. There's key questions that trigger responses to either elevator response or to, to lower a response. And uh, it, it, it works tremendously. And there's so much data that we can gather out of there. Plus all of our units are AD, have ADL locators on it and we use what they call a pulse system, which <coughs> basically shows all of the service area in the state of Arkansas. It shows exactly where our trucks are, how fast they're moving. Uh, it prioritizes the, the fastest response from the closest geographical unit that's available. So we constantly know where our guys are and uh, where their trucks are, whether they're stopped, whether they're moving, whether they're patient loaded, whether they're en route to a scene, on a scene, or at a facility, uh, receiving facility. And one of the nice things that the state of Arkansas did, and I know Jason has talked about this, Chief, uh, Middleton has talked about this, and uh, several, maybe other uh, of the uh, eight or the groups here in the village. But it, the Smart 911 system, and what the Smart 911 system is, is it, it is a, a gift from the state of Arkansas to the residents of the state of Arkansas. They purchased this system free, so it's free to you, and it's basically very simple. It's called Smart Now. I meant to bring my cards, I mean, my pamphlets for you, but I, I forgot that. But you can go online 
to smart911.com and you basically go in there and fill out a profile for yourself, for your family, the residents of your home, and you can put everything in there from the color of your dog to how many dogs you have in your house, where your keys located, who has who is your primary emergency contact, who might have the next access to get into your home, what color car you have in the driveway. I mean, you can build this profile any way you want and you can attach as many phone numbers to that profile that's under your residence. Like if you were the primary and, and you set it up for yourself, your phone number is going to be the primary. If you call from that phone, all of that information that you built in your profile will be, pop up immediately on our dispatch screens where we can give pre-arrival instructions to our, our uh, incoming units. Uh, it is unbelievable. It's free. People should take advantage of it. And a lot of people have here in the village. But the thing about it is, is that probably 90% of the nation has, has accepted this now and purchased it for their states. So if you are registered here, and you're traveling in California, your information follows you there. So if you call 911 from California and you have a profile, your pro you call from that phone that you set up, that automatically goes to their dispatch as well. So it, it is probably one of the highest technology, best thing as far as <coughs> 911 communication uh, that they've come up with in several years. Uh, on board our ambulances, that's one of the things, uh, and I know Chief will agree with this, uh, we, have, we have a brand new fleet of ambulances here in the village uh, right now. Uh, we try to keep our ambulances in tip-top shape, and uh, we have rules that we go by where we phase out ambulances after a certain mile. Uh, depending on volume of those calls, but we carry state-of-the-art equipment. One thing LockNet does not do is we we do not skimp when it comes to, to equipment. Uh, we practice evidence-based medicine, so we have the highest-tech cardiac monitors that do more than just cardiac monitoring. They, they do pacing, they do defibrillation, they collect data, they uh, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, cardiac uh, monitoring and 12 lead EKGs to the hospitals at a push of a button. Uh, we can download those into our electronic, they connect with our electronic tablets, our charting, and all that information is downloaded into our charts automatically. Um, we have, uh, I mean, from CPAP to, to I mean, it, it, it's so much different. EMS has evolved over the last 10 years. I can remember when I first started, I mean, the privileges that we had, it's, it, it's, a, it's a rolling emergency room. There's very little that we cannot do in the back of that ambulance other than surgery, and we can do some minor surgical procedures such as uh, treating a collapsed lung, putting in, you know, a needle in someone's chest, cutting someone's throat and putting a bright, you know, to do a bright thyroidomy. All of our guys are well trained. Uh, they're basically uh, what the state mandates us to have as credentials we expect and, and have uh, much more credentials than what's just required. All of our paramedics are nationally registered. That means that uh, pretty much they can work in any state in the United States uh, because they hold that national registry certification, which means they're certified nationally, not just in the state of Arkansas. Uh, it's a requirement uh, by, by LifeNet only. The state does not require that until just in the last six months, they grandfathered into the testing part of the national registry and uh, they made it toward the EMTs and then the paramedics have to hold that certification. And a lot of that's got to do with all of the national disasters that we have where we could be deployed if we have to go assist in other states. And that has happened occasionally. 
uh, with the hurricanes and stuff that we had to deploy a team to go help. Uh, just recently, and this is one of the things that me and Chief have talked about for a long time, and with Chief, uh, the fire department, you know, they did some reorganization with their manpower, uh, you know, and with the new station and stuff. So when we had a cardiac arrest, one of our our, our rules is, is that we do not transport a cardiac arrest without a third body on our truck. Uh, mainly to give the paramedic his hands free to do the emergency procedures he has, has to do. So it would require one of the firemen to get in the back of the truck with us and ride in on that trip, mainly to do CPR <coughs> and to, to, to give us another set of hands. But uh, within the last year, uh, we purchased what they call a Lucas device, which is a mechanical CPR resuscitation device. It's the gold standard in, in, in pre-hospital care right now. It basically is 99% more efficient than a human can ever do CPR. And it takes less than one minute to set up. You can stand a patient up on a backboard in a corner and it will still do adequate appropriate compressions and what that has done is freed us from utilizing chief's resources and taking them out of the village for 45 minutes to an hour to two hours so that's really helped a whole lot but we have a very good working relationship with the fire department uh, they're part of the backbone of our service here in the village the village is you know you've been in all a lot of homes you've seen a lot of driveways you know the terrain uh, they help us in so many different ways, and uh, we couldn't do it without them. Uh, we run totally ALS service here in the village, which is advanced life support, which means every time you get an ambulance, you will get a paramedic. Uh, oh. In Hot Springs, uh, we have we can build a basic level truck, which means it's only got two EMTs and they are for transport, they can treat at the basic level, but we only utilize them for like hospital to nursing home and psychiatric transfers. Uh, and, you know, mental health system is, is rampant, not just here in, in, in Garland County, but all the way, you know, across the nation. And the problem is placement of these patients because we don't have the, the facilities here in Garland County to place uh, psychiatric patients. So we have to, the hospitals have to shop to find placement. And sometimes it's in Texarkana, sometimes it's in Jonesboro, sometimes it's in, uh, you know, Fayetteville. It just, wherever they can find them, which means that instead of us tying up a paramedic level ambulance, we can use a basic level ambulance to get those patients transferred to their, the facilities that they need to do. Here in the village, uh, we have three locations. Uh, we have the Colella Post, which is where my office is as well, and it's there at 114 Los Lagos, right across from the radio station. Uh, we have two ambulances there, but only one of them is staffed. The second ambulance is uh, uh, what we consider our backup ambulance. Uh, we have a mechanical failure. We have another ambulance that we can immediately get back into. On high call volume days, or if we have a special event that we need to uh, be covering, we can put it on extra crew. I can get on that truck and build it up to a paramedic level ambulance just by just calling an EMT in. Uh, so we basically have three paramedic level ambulances running 24 hours a day with the ability to put a fourth one up at any time. Uh, we have our Colella post, we have our Forte. Cortez Post, which is at the Cortez Fire Station. They, shot, they sh basically have one end of the bit, small end of the building, and they, they're one big happy family out there. They work very good together. Uh, we also have our third post, which is the Balboa Fire Station. It's basically the same way the fire department is on the majority of one side, and we have quarters on the other side and house our ambulance. Uh, this is the big question that we always get. People don't understand how their membership works. And basically, uh, the POA pays us a subsidy of 60, 000, around $60,000 a month. And the reason for that is, is that the, para, uh, the, the POA requests that there be three paramedic level ambulances out here. And the only way 
that you can put afford that third paramedic level ambulance is through a subsidy because the volume is not here to support three paramedic level ambulances. Uh, and basically it's, a, it's a, probably one of the best deals going. It's one of the cheapest deals going for, I think they pay it by, by monthly. Uh, it's like $14 and 25 cents every two months. It's a stopping on your water bill, a separate line item. And what that gives you, it gives you a life that membership. It's not a free ambulance service. Uh, we're going to bill your insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance, a third party insurance. We're going to bill your insurance. And whatever insurance pays, we're going to take that as payment in full and write off the rest. So the uh, resident never sees any out of pocket money. Uh, even, you know, they pay their co pays and their deductibles as well because we just write them off. Uh, now, if you're uninsured, you're going to get a 40% discount on your bill, even if you're uninsured. One of the big things that is so hard to educate people with, and, and, and we're not, not going to change what we're doing because we don't define people's emergencies, they do. And when they call 911, you know, everybody reacts different. Everybody feels different about the nature and the extent of their injury or their illness. But sometimes there, we do, we transport patients that really could go by other means. Uh, they are not life-threatening. They're, they're, they do not require an ambulance. And when we do that, their insurance or Medicare or Medicaid or whatever will deny payment on that. And when that happens, it's out of the animal services control. We don't dictate what's medically necessary and what's medically not. The insurance companies do. Now, we, anytime that happens, like that goes in and it appeals it for the, 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 the resident. And a lot of times we get it turned around, but if we don't, those patients will still get a 40% discount on, on their bill, which also, that gives you unlimited ambulance service out of here, as long as it's medically necessary. And uh, one of the things we added when we brought the air program in here is we offered offered the air program that same as a benefit, just like the ambulances. So if you require a helicopter here in the village, which could you know, and I'm, I'm just being honest with you, it's health care. Uh, helicopter industry is extremely expensive. It could be anywhere from thirty to fifty to sixty thousand dollars for a flight, and we have took that upon ourselves to just build the insurance, or whatever insurance uh, pays us. We what we do, we don't just write it off. We absorb that cost. We pay our 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 partner, which is Air Methods for the price of the helicopter fly. And it's the right thing for us to do. We promised it from the very beginning and uh, Air Methods pulled back out on us, said, oh, you know, we shouldn't have made that decision, you know, because of the cost. But, you know, after two years of me educating the public that that is a benefit for them, Lockman made a decision that we're going to continue our commitment. So basically when we fly a patient out here, we build the they build their insurance and then whatever's left out of the bill like that absorbs that themselves. So it's it's a wonderful benefit. We don't try to call a helicopter unless it's justified. We leave those decisions to our crews, our trained crews to make those decisions. And it's usually a very time sensitive type of emergency, whether it be a, 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 a cardiac event where you have an acute myocardial infarction or a stroke that's within the retrievable window or trauma and uh, where speed is what you need, I mean, or thrombolytics. But it's worked very well. We work very close with the fire department. We have uh, uh, distinguished what we call pre-designated emergency landing zones here in the village. And we utilize golf course if we have to. We try not to. We utilize church parking lots. 
We have some designated landing zones, even at the, the one at Coronado Center. Uh, it just depends where the call is located in the village. Uh, if it's in the front, we try to use Walgreens, Walmart. I mean, you have, these are all pre-designated. They're built into our, 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 our dispatch system. The coordinates are all in there. It, and we let the fire department and the medics work together to make the decision what is the closest landing zone for that helicopter. And uh, so it, it, it is, uh, it is a, it's a great benefit to the residents of the village. Uh, air, air it, now, it doesn't, you don't get that benefit with any other air program. If we're on a flight and you, we have to call for another helicopter, you know, we can't honor their, I mean, we can't do it. That, you know, that's uh, basically, uh, we just don't cover any other, other ground or air provider that's not like that. Uh, just like they don't us, you know, if they, we have to use them. Uh, but Air Methods, the, the company that we work with, they basically own our pilots, our mechanics, and uh, they actually own the helicopter. We provide all of the clinical side of the house, uh, all of the training clinically, uh, and they do their own billing. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a great partnership so far. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, public education out here and, and how, how you guys can help and how residents can help. And it's basically the chain of survival. You know, knowing how to access your 911 CPR. You know, people's always been afraid to do CPR in the past because, uh, especially in times of the day where there's so many communicable diseases, you know, nobody wanted to put their mouth on somebody else's mouth and stuff. But I'll tell you, all that's gone away. The key thing to know is pump fast, pump hard. That saves lives. And early defibrillation. And the village is, is unique. For a community this size, there's more AEDs out in the community, uh, automatic defibrillators uh, in churches at the... Uh, uh, Centers. Here, here, there's a the golf course, and uh, the golf courses, the police department, all the fire department apparatus to carry these things. That's what saves lives. And uh, advanced paramedic level services. I mean, basic life support. What these guys, the fire guys, the, the average citizen, a six year old can work these things because you push a button and it tells you every step to do, prompts you completely watch you through it at the six, seven year old level. And, uh, uh, you know, most of the time in sudden cardiac arrest, somebody, most of the time the initial rhythm is a very treatable rhythm and it requires electricity. And if you, the quicker you can get that done, the more, uh, the survivability rate increases tenfold. And who in here is CPR survival? Not current. Not current. Do what? CPR certified? Not at the moment. AED certified? Okay. Uh, there at the Hot Springs Village, we do, we have about seven trainers, and we offer that in Hot Springs Village to organizations, groups, churches, uh, bystanders, people that uh, are in um, adoptions uh, that need CPR, first aid, uh, also foster home, foster parents. Uh, but we do so we do offer that. So if you guys or you know any organization or any groups, churches, let us know. Uh, give us a call at our fire station nine two 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 one zero, and we can and get some trainers to you guys. That way, everybody is is aware of what what CPR can do and what what lies. I mean, it, it saves lives. The ADs. There's multiple times that our ADs have. Uh, have saved lives. Uh, ten center golf courses. The ten Do you centers. just offer general classes yes. periodically? Yeah, and, you know, I'm going to chime in with Chief Miller because I think that's what he's telling you that he's offering you. But you know, we do the same thing. Uh, 
We do uh, bystander CPR and AED use classes. Now, a lot of the classes are not CARD certified classes. It's just public CPR. And uh, you don't need that card to save a life. You just need the knowledge of how to recognize the need for CPR and to pump hard, pump fast. And <coughs> be able to find your assets, your friends, or nearby standards or stranger to say, hey, I've been doing this for two minutes at 100, 100 compressions even a minute. Can you please give me a break? And you learn to communicate and just switch off. The whole deal is to not delay chest compressions and don't pause. And if you have to pause, it shouldn't be more than 10 to 15 seconds. So you're going to be caught by yourself sometimes. We've all been caught by ourselves where you're the only provider and you pump until you're too exhausted to pump anymore. And, but we have the resources here that we always get you enough help there. But uh, one of the things like that does, we have an AED matching uh, grant and loan program for AEDs. And what we'll, it's, it, it, it's only for non-profit organizations such as churches, first responder groups, uh, it excludes schools and universities because the schools usually get federal funding for their AEDs. Uh, and what LifeNet does, LifeNet will purchase an AED and their cost is around $1,275 for an AED. We'll pay half of it and the organization that wants the AED will let them pay for the other half. So we have a matching uh, deal, which is an excellent deal and a lot of people have taken advantage of it. A lot of your first responder groups have done it and a lot of the, several of the churches here in the village uh, have, have uh, did the uh, pay half the cost of the AED. We also have a loaner AED for not for profit events and it, it's free. It requires a $250 deposit, but we'll give it back to you soon as you bring your AED back. But we have an AED that like, for instance, the, I'm, I'm just hypothetically, the Anglers Club is, decides to have a big tournament and they're, they're gonna have a large gathering and uh, they want an AED on, on site. They can come up there and, and check out this AED, give us a $250 deposit and it's ready to go. And when they're done with it, if they didn't use it, they get their deposit back. If they did use it, they get their deposit back. We just have to, there's a form in there that shows why they used it, who they, you know, who they used it on, what was the situation, what was the scenario, but we can act, collect that data. And really no one's taking advantage of that here at the village uh, because there are so many AEDs out there now. It's, it's, but you know, it's, what basically what I'm saying, it's there to offer if, if needed to the community. Uh, and uh, we do community education, uh, just like Chief was saying, we do bystander CPR AD uh, classes. We have, one of the big things now is stop the bleed. And you know, people, uh, <coughs> Our age, back in the days, you know, tourniquets were a no-no unless it was life or limb, you know. Tourniquet is go standard of care down for hemorrhage control. Every law officer has one on their belt. Every fireman carries one. Every EMS personnel carries one. Uh, I mean, it is unbelievable on the car wrecks that we will look at on nowadays that law enforcement is there before, or the fire department is there before we are. And you get there and you've got a patient that has a tourniquet on their arm and their life was saved because of that. And uh, we teach how to apply not just the tourniquet, but also to uh, do image control with dressings, pressure points. We teach those classes as well. We have a team of uh, certified stop the bleed trainers and I think, do you have any, you have any of this? Okay. Uh, we do 911 education classes, ambulance tours, career fairs, and just basically uh, continued education. We do all of our own in-house training for our, uh, our medics. Uh, 
Again, they, they are required to hire, have higher certifications uh, than what the state requires. They have to have advanced cardiac life support. They have to have neonatal advanced life support. They have to have uh, pediatric uh, life support. They have to have ATLS, which is a, uh, advanced traumatic uh, trauma life support. And they have to have PHTLS, which is free hospital trauma life support. We require all of our personnel to hold these certifications. It is not a requirement. The state only requires you to hold a CPR card an advanced cardiac life support card. That is it. Uh, but we basically have every certification that a, a paramedic can hold, uh, even critical care paramedic, where they are able to basically do long distance interfacility transfer with that critical patient that may be on a ventilator and five or six different medication drips on a pump. Uh, uh, where it, it requires higher technology, higher skills. We have several critical care paramedics and our flight team, uh, all of our flight teams is a nurse paramedic and a paramedic. Uh, and they are all certified flight paramedics, critical care paramedics or certified flight nurse paramedics. So uh, they have, we have an accreditation called AIMS for the helicopter program as well. So we're extremely proud of it. I, I know I'm just like Chief, we're very passionate about our operations. We're very proud of them. We, I feel like the village between the fire department and EMS probably has some of the most tenured, educated, mature, well-trained staff in, in the state of Arkansas. The community out here is very blessed. And uh, uh, I, I, I can sit here and talk all day long about them. I'm not sure Chief could too, because we're so proud of them. But we are very passionate about it, very proud of our services that we provide out here. And, you know, we always try to put the community and the patient first in everything we do. So, uh, with that said, if y'all have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. One of the questions that I'd like to ask is what is your average response time here in the village? Okay, contractually, we're required to ELA. And me and Chief had this conversation yesterday because I, I, I've been doing this for 40 years. Response times means nothing in the outcomes of patients to me. I've seen it, witnessed it. There's data out there across the nation, but there, anytime you're working for with a company, they need to measure something. And response times is the easiest thing to measure. Contractually, we're required to on any priority one, priority two call, which is an emergency where it requires lights and sirens. We are required to meet an eight minute and 59 second response time uh, from the time that truck starts rolling until it's on your scene. And we're required to do it 90% of the time. I will tell you, but like I said before, the village is a geographical nightmare. Mm -hmm. it, we struggle to meet that 90% of the time, but we have yet since 2009, not met it. Now, we may be 90.6%, we may be 91%, we may be 92%, but we struggle and uh, to meet that response time, but without putting our guys in jeopardy, because, you know, I don't want them out here driving 80 mile an hour on these hilly roads, uh, trying to just to meet the response time. Uh, I wish that uh, there was a way that we could do away with response times and then really look at manages quality of patient care. Because, the, you know, I'm a true believer that you ought to take lights and sirens off of the animals. There's proven data out there that it makes no difference. You're not going to get there any quicker. Especially and in the village. That, that, that's the honest cause <laughs> truth. You're just not going to get there any quicker. People do not pay attention to animals as they don't have any respect for response. and. You're jeopardizing not just your, your crew, but a patient on board and your crew, and also the community outside when you do it. And uh, they ought to, we ought to be looking, and we do personally, but the nation needs to be looking at the quality of patient care and the outcomes of patient care instead of how quick did it take you to get there. There's very few emergencies that exist that require speed, and that is acute hemorrhage that cannot be controlled and cardiac arrest. 
There are some time sensitive emergencies where time is muscle, brain, and uh, you know, one minute is not gonna make a difference uh, in the outcomes of those patients. It's just not going to, but it is what it is, and we're all required to meet those standards, and so far we've been able to do that. Well, the reason I ask that is it curiously whether you think we have enough ambulances enough here in the village or if if it's a situation where we need maybe a, an additional to reach those outlying areas okay i'm gonna i'm gonna, I'm gonna answer this frankly and i don't mean uh, in any way to be disrespectful i understand everybody would like to have an ambulance in their backyard every one of us uh and I have told the village, like that has told the village, we'd be happy to put another ambulance out here. But we tell you what that's gonna happen. It's gonna increase your subsidy dues. Because it no way it can be paid for without increasing subsidy dues on the village. And uh, do I believe we need four out here? I would like to have 10 out here. It would make my life easier and my crew's life easier. In, but it was, I'm gonna tell you, it's not gonna make the residents of the village any safer or secure. Thank you. Uh, and there's a lot of question, why do we respond outside the village? And we have mutual, aid, uh, we're required by the Arkansas Department of Health to have at least three mutual aid agreements with outside providers. And we're fortunate here because we are in the condition I have a mutual aid agreement with Hot Springs. I have a mutual aid agreement with Malvern. I have a mutual aid agreement with Celine that Tran Ambulance Service. And I did have a fourth one in Perry County, but that service has basically moved so far northeast, which has caused us to have to, to, to uh, cover a portion of Perry County now. Uh, but people, a lot of people will say, well, we pay a subsidy, why are you going outside the gates to the village? And I'll tell them, you can tell me not to go outside the gates of the village, and that's exactly what we'll do contractually, but your subsidy cost is gonna go up because without us being able to absorb some of the revenue from outside the gates, we would never exist. No ambulance service would exist. Second of all, those people pay memberships. They pay their own memberships to get some of those privileges. Some of them do not have memberships. But the thing about it is your families utilize Walmart. Your families travel their highways between Hot Springs and, and the village. Your children go to school at Jesseville. And I think it's only right if your husband goes down cardiac arrest at Walmart on aisle four, do you want to wait 45 minutes for an ambulance or do you want one from the village? Correct. And it's the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, we will continue to do it. We've been able to make, meet all of our contractual demands. We have the highest customer service rating in the state of Arkansas, the village does itself. We average about, we, we have a third party vendor that does customer uh, surveys for us. We have no part in it whatsoever. And they compare us to, to 50 other ambulance services in the nation compared to our size and operational type. And we always are in the top four out of those 50. Uh, we've never been below 93% average in customer service. Uh, sure, we have unhappy customers. Uh, and mainly it's because they don't understand. But one of the things, uh, and they, you know, people get hysterical. And it, it's like I said before, we don't define people's emergencies. They do. And everybody's different. What's an emergency to me may be totally different to what's an emergency to you. What's a necessity for an ambulance may be totally <clears throat> different for you than it is what I would think it is. But it's it's understandable. They're, they're not educated to the medical side. And when a family member is sick or a loved one is sick, people get excited. People, uh, you know, time seems like forever when it was only just a short period of time. Anyway, we deal with those things just like everybody else deals with those things, but we deal with them immediately. And we have a database uh, that we record every complaint. One of the things also about the village is every response in the village, every response, 100% is quality 
uh, through our quality assurance program is audited. Mm -hmm. It's audited by a clinical steering team made up of physicians and uh, tenured field training officer medics. It 100%. Most ambulance services only require 30% of their calls to be audited. We do 100% in the village. And I did that on purpose from the very beginning when I took operations manager here. So, and, and we do very well. Y'all, the, the village is really, really, really lucky when it comes to the staff you have. We have the most tenured, educated staff in the village. Most of them are 10, 15 year plus paramedics. They work in metropolitan cities. They worked in rural areas. They're very, uh, they're, they're, they're just tenured medics. They've been there, done that, seen that, and they're highly qualified. Uh, occasionally we'll have one or two, you know, that's the way systems work. We either lose somebody through retirement or, or in this younger generation or well-trained and they come up and, and we do have a few younger paramedics out here working in the village now, but they also know what the expectations are and they also have to meet the qualifications and they're well-trained. So, and well-managed, I feel. So, uh, but it, it, it is very assuring to me to know that I don't, I have, you know, a medic that's been practicing for 10 years and uh, knows exactly what they're doing. Uh, it, it, it's reassuring to me if I was a resident out here to know that that was the quality of staff I had. So any other questions for me? Just, oh. one, just one quick one. I'm new here. What hospital do you normally transport? Okay. To? Well, you know, and that's another one of the big questions. A lot of people say, my heart doctor's in Little Rock. We want to go to Little Rock. Well, I'm not going to take our emergencies. Huh? Yeah. Mostly on emergencies. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to take you to Little Rock. I, I, we have three operating hospitals within our operational area. That is CHI, National Park, and Saline Memorial. I will tell you this, Arkansas Heart Hospital there, uh, the new one that's right down past the Lean Memorial now will be opening soon. And I can foresee us transporting patients to that facility, okay? It's only two or three minutes more, but here's the deal that I can't get people to understand and they should. If CHI is the only level two trauma center in South Central Southwest Arkansas, the only level two trauma center. The only level one trauma center is UA University of Med Center and Children's for Pediatrics. The next closest level one trauma center is the Med in Memphis. So the difference in that is CHI has the ability to take care of any level one trauma. They just don't, the difference is, is that they, a level one has to have a 24 hour a day on-site surgical crew, a 24-hour on-site neurosurgeon, a 24-hour on-site neuro, neuro uh, interventionist, uh, a 24-hour on-call thoracic surgeon, on 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 premises, and UA Med Center has that. That's why they're the only level one. Now the capabilities of of CHI being a level two is no different than UA. We have the people there, they're just not on site. It may take 15 to 20 minutes to go there. And we have, a, the, if it, the, we have the Arkansas trauma system in place now, which is called TraumaCon. Our paramedics and EMTs are required to call from the scene immediately on any uh, trauma that's not considered minor. If you fall and break your hip, that's considered a minor trauma, but if you have a uh, a closed head injury, or you've got a chest injury, abdominal injury, or more than one large bone extremity, we are required to call the Arkansas Trauma Con from the scene immediately and say, hey, this is what I got. And they're looking at a dashboard of all across the state, and they're telling you what capabilities the closest facility has, and they, they can't tell us where to go, 
that they can suggest this is the appropriate place for you to transport this patient. Now, naturally, if I'm here in the village and helicopters down for weather or maintenance or whatever, and our guys get on a trauma, especially up towards the front gate, trauma con is the first suggestion it's going to be. I would prefer you to go to UA Med Center, but you need to go to CHI because they know that it's 45 minutes to an hour to the UA Med Center and it's 20 minutes to CHI. And those patients, patients, all we can do is control hemorrhage, take care of their airway, take care of their underlying medical read things, but what those people need is surgery and blood. And we can't do surgery and we're not, you know, carrying blood on the ambulances. So uh, to answer your question, uh, people don't realize that Saline is a capable hospital. They're a level three trauma center, not a level two, but they have a, a, a cath lab, they have a CT scanner, they have a neurosurgeon, they have an emergency room. And if I am taking a chest pain patient, a patient that has had an inactive in, in heart attack, and they want me to take them to badness. When I passed the lean hospital going that way, I just said, I can take better care of this patient in the back of this ambulance than they can in a hospital I just passed. And that's not true. There's no way. I don't have a cath lab. All I can do is see what I'm seeing on the monitor and, and treat my patient symptomatically. I don't know for sure. I can assume and predict through my education that this is what it is, but my your insurance company is gonna deny your bill because they're gonna want you to go to the closest appropriate medical facility with the capabilities. And we will do that. And if they need, after the patient is stabilized, if they, their physician and their self decide that they need to go to another facility, we'll arrange transportation for that. But in an emergency situ situation, we're going to one of the uh, three operational uh, hospitals within our operational uh, deal. And it's basically, in the best interest of the patient, financially and medically. <clears throat> I think I took up my arm. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Jason, do you have anything you want to add, real quick? Uh, you want to add? <laughs> no, I really don't. I, I mean, he's, I was, I was actually, I was actually thinking because really the spirit of this meeting was to talk specifically about sort of emergency services. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking it might be good if the fire chief came back for a, another month and talked about all of the fire department's total services. Okay. I think that might be yeah. interesting. And I would like to add one thing. <coughs> the, the way we're set up out here, and it, it's kind of a gentleman's agreement, I think. I think that Jason has been given some directive, but I usually, my liaison to the POA, and a lot of times I have, uh, uh, meetings with the POA board and uh, now that I haven't met the general manager yet I've been waiting to kind of get we're kind of not on his priority list right now so I haven't really wanted to bother him but Jason has always been my liaison to the POA if I have a problem or I have a need or we have we, we need to work something out together I usually start with Jason and go to Jason first and then we go through there and vice versa so we work real close together and, you know, we always got big plans of doing more and more and uh, that's what's not, it's just a, it's a wonderful, the, the, we, it's, it's like I said before, the fire department out here is excellent and they're such a resource and an asset for us and for y'all. So and what uh, I'm saying is we, we first respond yeah. to just about, just about anything, mm -hmm. um, major medical. Uh, we will first respond. If, if, if uh, LifeNet is out of the village, uh, we don't have a close unit, uh, of course, they call us and we respond as well. We go and, and stabilize and, and stay with the patient until we get the next closest ambulance to them. Uh, and, but there's, we're so, you know, we're limited to our care of what we can provide. Um, so, I mean, we, we, we don't push drugs. I mean, we're, we're basically like the BLS unit of, which, of an ambulance service. Uh, but we do carry all, all of that stuff.
Jason, I did have kind of one question. Do you do training for businesses as well? Like if I wanted to have all my employers got all my employees come and do CPR and have CPR training and have you done that for POA employees as well? I've done it for POA employees. We do it for uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of the POA employees and we have to get back on that because I think a lot of them are out of, out of date. But um, businesses, yes, uh, we will provide that for the businesses. Okay. Uh, we, we do it for our uh, our uh, daycares, our schools, and things like that too. So, okay, cool. Is there anything as villagers we could do to make your jobs easier? Uh, support us. Yeah, that's the <laughs> we definitely need uh, that. You know that that's that, and we do. I mean, uh, with, with the uh, fire department, EMS, we get a lot of support, um, and it's it's really cool because we uh, they support us through our bellies, uh, <laughs> and, and it's it's really neat. But the best you know the best thing of being in this service is is the outcome of the patient. Yeah. Um, you know, when you work a call and you're like, I wonder how that patient made it. You know, did they make it? And then, you know, a month later they come by the station to thank you. You know, there's no other great feeling in the world. No, and you see that life and that person come back and say thank you. It's such a moving part between us two. We have such a, a, a close, well working group between the departments and you know there are times when they are it they are it until we get the closest ambulance to them i mean it can get busy out here and we can go to level zero and you know once or twice a day and you know and you, it, and you pull up there and you know you feel helpless because you you don't know what your limitations are and your capabilities are and you provide as much as you that as you can, and then again, you know, a couple of weeks later, those folks. And that's one thing I found so much about the village is that people here in the village really do appreciate. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, go work in different environments. Go work in the city of Hot Springs. Uh, uh, the city of Hot Springs is not a safe place to live. And I mean, uh, when you see those kind of outcomes, when you thought, golly. And you know, even after as long as I've been doing it, I mean, I could pull up on the scene without pretty much any equipment. I pretty much make a pretty accurate decision on the mortality of that patient. And uh, it's wonderful when you're wrong. It's wonderful when you're wrong. And it's wonderful when you get that thank you. We don't get thank yous. Very seldom do we get thank yous. But I, I, I think Chief tell you that we're not in the business for these thank yous. We do this because it's a passion and we love it. And I also believe that it's a gift. And especially to do it as long as, because burnout on paramedics and EMTs is less than five years. Most of them never stay in, this, in the business more than five years. And we have multiple staff members that have been doing this for 15 years plus. Uh, Ronnie, Ronnie, just for reference, what's uh, the high volume time down in Garland County? Just how many folk, how many ambulances are on? Uh, on a, between the village of Malvern and Hot Springs, we usually have somewhere between, usually around 14 trucks on a day. So, uh, we I have just, so folks that didn't know, that how yeah. many trucks are out there? Yeah, we have the ability to put on 25 trucks if we have to. So. That's the reason I said it's so important for us to have mutual aid. I'll tell you one thing that we don't do. We do it with every service other than the village. And it's because the village pays the subsidy. We don't get any subsidy anywhere else in any of our other divisions. And yes, we do run calls in Hot Springs. We do not, one, the difference is, is that if Hot Springs goes level zero. I mean, I mean, that's every one of their trucks are on emergency. They're tied up. They have no more resources left. An emergency comes in. They're going to look at what unit is the most ge geographically closest truck. It could be a Malvern unit. It could be a village unit. They're going to send that unit. 
Now, 90% of the time, we may get a fourth of the way there, a half of the way there, and get canceled because another ambulance in town just cleared up. Correct. Okay? And then they're going to send that. But I would a lot rather fight in a courtroom saying, oh, we sat with one of our resources out at the village because we didn't want to send it to Hot Springs. And at least we responded something. Yes. We had something perpetual motion, you know, moving forward. And it happens. And, uh, and the same thing happens we, here. Yeah, you know, we know we're level zero. I can sit there. If we have something major, they're going to send a unit yes. on town now, to cover the village. We don't, we don't go, like if I see Hot Springs at level one, they got one ambulance left. And it's a busy day. I don't take one of the village trucks and move it to Highway 5 and 7 and let it post closer. And they don't do it either. Right. All right. Now, we do do that for Malvern because they don't get a subsidy, so they can, we can run the operation basically however we want. Plus, they have, you know, more resources. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if, if Perry County EMS calls me right now and says, hey, we don't have any resources left. And I've got, you know, a lady on Highway 314 having a heart attack. We're going. Yeah. We're going. It's the right thing to do. Everybody deserves the same, pay, you know, care. Now, there's a lot of village residents that will see an ambulance outside the village running lights and sirens, and I'll get a phone call. Why is your ambulance running lights and sirens for truck springs? Well, yeah. it could be one or two things. They could be have a sick resident in the back of their truck going to the hospital. And second of all, they may be responding to an emergency in town. And, you know, you'll notice the difference in the trucks. All of our village trucks are marked and branded for the village. And you will see some of that trucks that are not branded village. And those trucks are coming from town to run trips here at Hot Springs. But these guys are on scene already. We don't, you know, that's the nice thing about them. If we don't have an ambulance available, we call them. They first respond. They give us a quick heads up and assessment. There's times we may just need a helicopter. And uh, I mean, it's just that everybody has to work together. And uh, at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do. And another thing is too, you know, one of the things that's different in the village, and I know that Chief will back me up on this, we don't, we don't, we do it elsewhere, but we don't do as much as we do in the village. I may run 15, between the three trucks out here in the village, they may run 15 responses in one day. 15. Out of those 15 responses, they may only transport 10 of those patients to the hospital. We have a lot of patients here in the village that live alone. We have a lot of patients here in the village where their spouse is their primary caregiver. And uh, we have, a, uh, I mean, and when I say primary caregiver, you have one party of, of, of the, the, the relationship that is either bed confined or walks with a walker or has difficulty getting around and uh, they, they need to be assisted from their bed to their potty chair and we get calls because and you know, they, we get calls because they were doing the movement to the potty chair and all they did was slide down to the floor and the wife is you know small and feeble and her husband's big and large and she can't get any help even get up Mm -hmm. And uh, we don't want her to hurt herself. Then we got two patients, and they call 911. Well, we go there. Sometimes the fire department goes there if we're not available, or sometimes we all go together. It depends on, the, on that. But uh, we assist that patient. We, don't, we assess them to make sure they're not hurt. We assist those patients back to their bed or wherever, whatever that party needs, we do. But what that thing does, you think about, go back to our response times and why it's so difficult to maintain those response times. For every one of those calls that we do, it ties up one of my resources to go to the next emergency. And, uh, but we're not gonna change that because I honestly, it is the right thing to do for our community. And we don't charge for it whatsoever. And uh, we do a lot of it here in the village, I'm a lot sure of it. Do. Well, and, uh, EMS lifts. 
<laughs> and I will tell you, there's sometimes that our paramedics have to act. And, you know, the last thing I ever wanted to do with paramedic is to look at a patient and a patient or, or, and their wife or their husband and say, listen, you can't do this anymore. You're not capable of taking care of him or you're not capable of taking care of yourself. I can't let you live in these conditions anymore. And I have to call adult protective services. And, you know, there's nothing worse than taking somebody's freedom away from them. And we have a lot of people out here that will, there's some sick people in the village. And a lot of our calls are very emergent because the people that are in their 70s, 80s, and older are very stoic. They, they, they were raised in a time where you just didn't go to the doctor for everything. But their biggest fear, their biggest fear is if I call 911 and you show up, you're going to take me away and I'm never going to get to come back. So they sit on their illness or they sit on their sickness until they're so sick they become acute and true emergency. When you know, if they would have just called and let us put them into the system, get them taken care of, because there's so many different options for them. But that's their biggest fear. Their their fear to be taken out of out of their norm, uh, their normalcy, and their their fear if you take them out of your home, they're never going to get to come back. And it's it it takes a unique. I, that's why we don't just have. It's everybody. That works for life net would love to work in the village would love to but to get to be an employee in the village takes years and years of proving yourself mm -hmm. this is a different clientele out here They're almost 90 percent or even more are all retired educated professionals in some kind or another and they, you know, they know what they want and they appreciate what they get, but they're also very stoic and very afraid to lose their freedom. And we see that every day. And, you know, it's the hardest thing to do is to make that decision as a, as a pre hospital provider to say, you know, I can't let you live in this field. I can't let you. You can't take care of you. you hey, there's no one to feed you. You can't feed yourself. You, you, your, you, your bed's been sold for two weeks. I mean, you just can't do it. And you have to use your resources to get care for those people. And, but it's a hard thing to do. So a lot of people just don't call until the last minute, until they don't even have any other choice. And then by the end, you could have prevented a lot of things. All right. Thank Th thanks, guys, very much. It was super informative. I think a lot of folks, I'm sure, will see it, and we listen from the newspapers on as well on our on our Zoom meetings. So I'm sure we'll you can see more about this in the newspaper coming up for the next week or so. And I certainly learned a lot today. And I had never heard of Smart 911, and I'm going to go sign up for that. So <laughs> and, and, news to me. Yeah, you got to say, Lewis, you're out there in your article. You write on this. Tell people to watch the presentation because this should did it get recorded today. Yes, it got recorded, so this would be good for people to watch Ronnie's right. presentation because you haven't made it in a while at the POA board, have you? Yeah. yeah. So good. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks so much for coming out. Thank you for being with us. You guys can uh, you guys can head out if you like. We're going to go ahead with the rest of our rest of our business meeting here. Thank you so much again. And can you get us an electronic copy of this as well? So we can send it to the rest of the committee. Just so uh, send it to email. Send it to Bob. Okay, here. Here, Bob. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So <laughs> <laughs> kept me, kept me away. Thank you, thank you.
Thank you. All right, we'll continue on with the, uh, with the rest of the meeting. Uh, any changes to the uh, to the minutes from last month? Everybody received the last month's minutes. Any corrections or anything else to the to the minutes for last month? The only thing is David Childs was both present and absent. Yeah. So other than David Childs being both present and absent, he was absent from the meeting last month. Uh, we'll make that change. Any other changes to the meeting minutes from last month? All right. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and assume those are approved. Uh, we'll move ahead uh, with the rest of the agenda. We don't have anyone at the meeting today from the POA, so we won't have any POA reports uh, today. Pam did let me know that she would not be in attendance. Uh, I don't know about Charles, uh, but we don't have anyone from the POA to speak to the POA board or any issues relative to the POA today. Um, on broadband services, uh, Keith and I, along with Dennis Simpson, did go and meet with the Finance and Budgeting Committee uh, here a week or so ago. Uh, talk to them about what we're seeing relative to uh, the internet services in the village and trying to help them determine how they might think about a kind of a strategy moving forward. Uh, it's a very difficult topic, which now I think they understand that it's a very difficult topic as well. Um, you know, there are things that people can do. I think the biggest challenge and, and one of the things that, you know, that I think they understand now is that it, it's tough for a, a consumer to figure this out on their own. Right. While well, yes, you could get a wireless hotspot or you could get, you know, this other technology or whatever, that requires some amount of technical knowledge of the person that's consuming it, which is difficult. Uh, and that's what's been filled by, you know, the people like the Sunlinks and ATTs and that they send someone out, they hook it all up, they have 24 hour support. Uh, if you start to move to more self-service models, it's difficult for a lot of people here in the village to do that. Uh, there is activity moving along with Aristotle. Uh, I'll ask, uh, Keith, you want to just give a little bit on that? Sure. Uh, the, we've asked, you know, we put that out there to have people populate the state database. And then we also have the graphical depiction from the POA now, finally. Uh, they continue to work on trying to refine the proposal to, to meet the state's, hopefully, standards so we can get some of the grant money uh, within the village. Uh, as of this the past week and a half, Aristotle has been communicating back and forth with the state broadband office, trying to find that right proposal to qualify for the grant money. And that's, that's been a little challenging. Uh, we did, I did send to all the kind of the neighborhoods that I know of are hurting kind of that northern ridge of the village and then down by the glazy pole gate that are in within Saline County to kind of help to see if we can get it. So this is going to be a work in progress and I've told Greg to stand by um, and myself if we get to the point where we have to go sit and talk with the state broadband office one on one and it kind of explain and walk them through the POA data and walk them through what their actual uh, their test results are showing. Uh, the hardest part still remains is the major providers still say they have the village sufficiently covered and we know there are people out there in the village who are not getting 25-3 and that's that's the hard part right now and we'll continue fighting it and it, it's going to be a challenge but we have until the end of the year to try to wrestle uh, with the state and hopefully Aristotle because they're willing to come into the village to provide some competition too uh, not only the unserved areas, but provide some competition too. And I think that's the hardest part is there's not a lot of competition. Not a lot of parts of the areas that can you can you say at t or Sunlink. It's either one or the other. Is Aristotle like a cable system or is it more? It's a it's like a hot at t It's a fixed wireless solution. It's fiber to a fixed wireless, and that's one of the things that working with Aristotle the past week is them trying to figure out where do they run try to run fiber to, and mm -hmm. that's, that starts driving cost differences too. So they they are trying to find a solution that the state would would agree to to get us up there. And the biggest challenge, or one of the challenges, is Desoto Boulevard is great. AT&T and Suddenlink running right down to Soto Boulevard. It's those edges, the northern and the southern edges and the Cortez area. It's hard to get there. 
And there's a reason at and and Sunlink haven't went there, because it was costly to them. Right. So it's, it's one of those catch-22 situations. Right. But Aristotle is a wireless internet service provider. They don't do television right. or it, telephone it, or strictly internet. internet service well, they, they provider. Well, they can do telephone. Well, you can yeah. run voice over IP they over the internet, so IP. it's not like traditional telephone. Right. Uh, type of service, but one of the things that you know Keith mentioned, we did get the map, uh, the GIS map, finally uh, from the survey, and it was pretty evident. We actually did were able to use that to highlight some areas that have significant coverage problems, right, or or issues where the speed of coverage is significantly slower than the state standard. So it sort of identified areas that we knew anecdotally we thought had these problems, and it showed up on that map. Uh, Keith, you want to go ahead with sure. Saline County? Saline County, just a few things. First, I'll start with Metro Plan. Uh, Metro Plan has pretty, been pretty quiet here during the summer. Uh, the one big issue that is it all for their grant money, for their transportation planning uh, dollars, and they have about $11 million to spread out across the four um, county region that they're looked at. Saline County has put in a grant request uh, for the Southwest Trail. So that's what's kind of cooking in Saline County, trying to get some Metro Plan dollars for Southwest Trail, and we'll see if that uh, meets the criteria, or the priorities, and when they do all the scoring. But that's really from the Saline County side. For the Saline County Quorum Court, three different things when they took off, uh, but 911 consolidation is going forward between Saline County and Benton. That that will be one set, one one piece app mm -hmm. uh, sitting there. The unfortunate part is still Brian will not be part of that, uh, but uh, Benton and Saline County agreed and most of all the documents have been approved and the quorum courts approved it to uh, move forward with one uh, dispatch center there. It actually is, it remains in the Saline County Emergency Management Office there. Uh, second one, the Saline County Quorum Court did, uh, just like the POA, uh, voted on the issue one resolution to support the, the continuation of the half cent sales tax. Um, it's interesting. Um, it was not unanimous. We did have some Quorum Court members who did not vote for the, the highway uh, funding. Um, it's just kind of interesting seeing the dis dispersity on this, and the main thing is they're, they're not going to vote for a tax, but at the same time, if this goes away to Saline County, it's a $1.1 million hit for loss of revenue, and it's the same way in Garland County. But uh, it did pass, uh, but there were some some opposition to it, and that's, that, that's their choice, uh, and they voiced their concerns on it. And then on an even more happier note, for the quorum court we'll have to deal with in budget um, coming up here, is the presentation has been made that they did a wage survey of the Saline County wages versus the wages of other county employees in the area, and we're nine percent below median. Uh, so that will be an issue that the Saline County quorum court will be dealing with very shortly in the budget because we are concerned about our quality of or able to keep our employees and it really hits home in the, the public safety sector on mm -hmm. uh, the sheriff and in the detention center and even into the road department on some of those entry level positions there so that's going to be a, a an interesting budget discussion of how we're going to have to uh, pay for that uh, but I think it's important all the county officials, all the elected officials have come out and supported that in, in a mass to a tooth every county official said, hey, we need to do this. And then the minimum wage going up to $11 an hour has really impacted that too. So uh, just that's, I'm sure, you know, the POA will have to be looking at that, but I'm just letting you know that Saline County has to look at it in the near term because we want to keep good quality employees uh, on the county. Well, okay, well, that's all I have. That's the same question. Thanks. Kurt, any update on the census numbers? No, no change really. at all? 
there was an interest expressed by the Democratic Party uh, in Hot Springs Village to go ahead with some kind of a forum, but the time frame was such that, I mean, with this close to the election, it just wasn't feasible to put it together. So I declined that and had to justify it to them. I promised them that we would not do something with the Republicans without including them. <laughs> so that's where it stands right now. No, we, we really have nothing going on. Yeah. It's a dead issue. It has been since it really started. Yeah. And we did reach out to them months ago and you know, I mean, we started reaching out to them like in March or April, yeah, April so, yeah, way sometime back. Sometime in that time frame, and there was no responses, and it kept trying to contact both parties, and they just weren't willing to talk until uh, 30 some days ahead of the election. And that's just. I'm still not aware of them doing any in person events at all. I think they're trying to, but I, I don't, you know, I mean, even, even I even proposed to them. Uh, not do it in person. We weren't talking about in person. We were talking about doing right. virtual, and that didn't, that didn't go over with them until the last moment. So. And there was one virtual uh, candidate forum across Saline County about two weeks ago. Yeah, that yeah. was done. An organization put it together, and about fifteen candidates were on the the Zoom call. Yeah, so it happened. Yeah, and. Uh, but I know the uh, Republican Party in Garland County has been holding, has held a couple of in person, and I think the Democratic Party is maybe has done one or one or something like that. But uh, that's it. Yeah. Any update on the census stuff, uh, Jim? Anybody? Jim? Jay, I'm uh, I'm 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 here again. Uh, I will tell you uh, two things, and I, I could talk an hour on this, but I will not do it. I promise you that. Let me give you two sets of facts. First, the census will formally close on Monday. On October 16th, there will be no more census activity. Since we last met, the Census Bureau has released a new set of numbers for the states. That set of numbers combines the self-response that we've talked so much about with the field response, which is the uh, door knocking to get a comprehensive number. That comprehensive number has been released for all the states and puts Arkansas at 99.9% .9 response rate. Now, they have not released or I have not been able to locate the numbers for the political subdivisions, but you can do the math on this and understand that if all the political subdivisions or if the state is at 99.9%, then all the political subdivisions um, have to be near that. So that's what I know. Uh, all of that is different. There's a lot of chaos surrounding the census, pro census process, uh, the early closing and all that, but it is what it is. And that's the best number I have to report. So it's 99% of respondents of the people they think are here? Is that what that means? I mean, I guess I don't understand it. 99.7, they have had responses, either self responses or from a census taker knocking on the door in 99.9% .9 of the households in Arkansas. Hmm. That, that not seems, the people, that not the like people, the household. That's almost as good as a North Korean election. <laughs> well, I mean, what was it last time? What was it the last census? It was about sixty. When 60. you look at when you look at the state reports, um, there is not a state that's reported under. 
95%. Okay, we'll leave it at that. So we can expect... Uh, you know, that's just what I read. <laughs> so we can expect about a 95 to 99% participation in the presidential election, huh? Right. I think of the increase in revenue will get off the census. <laughs> The population goes down. Yeah, but just, yeah, the numbers don't. Anyway, okay. Uh, any other committee reports? All right, well, that's uh, Dr. Murphy. You've been patiently hanging in there. <laughs> How you doing? How's hey, school going? Doing great. Uh, school's going well. You know, we've went through uh, some peaks in the uh, COVID reporting and quarantining, and we're kind of at, we're at a lull in terms of uh, number of students quarantined and had all of our students in school that wanted to be in school, excluding one as of yesterday, when our quarantine numbers have been as high as 60 in a given uh, period of a week. So we're kind of uh, enjoying a little bit of uh, better stability. Uh, we did have a test positive with an employee that I was made aware of this morning, which that would uh, facilitate a contact tracing measure that uh, we're currently investigating and we'll be reporting that to the Department of Health. Um, you know, activities, we've been able to host activities, hold activities, whether it be volleyball, tennis, or other related activities with minimal cancellation. Uh, Arkadelphia currently has canceled uh, two weeks in a row. We're slated to play them next week, and I anticipate that we will probably have to cancel that game based on uh, their kids not being able to practice for an extended period of time because some of the real concerns associated with this virus and, and uh, students is, uh, one, them not being able to remain consistent with their physical activity, but two, any individual who does test positive, they react differently when they increase their heart rates. And so uh, I would tell you that we have, as leaders, uh, worked very closely with uh, the Department of Health. There is a COVID-19 task force that meets in a Zoom meeting similar to this every Monday. It involves the Arkansas Department of Health, all the local schools, along with the hospitals and uh, clinics. And it really allows for everyone uh, and the county, county facilitates it in Garland County. So we, uh, we feel as though that uh, uh, we're communicating well uh, trying to continue to manage and mitigate the risk associated with on-site instruction. And uh, we're now at a point after about six plus weeks of evaluating the impact on-site instruction as well as virtual instruction, uh, contemplating the restructuring of uh, what our school week will look like to ensure that our virtual learners uh, are being uh, engaged in the same manner as the on-site students are. So. Uh, um, by far, we don't have a polished product. Uh, I think that we will continue to look seriously at the level of services rendered. Here again, reminding the community that the staffing model that we have is relatively, you know, we've hired three additional paras last night at a special meeting because we cannot uh, get substitutes to come in and cover all these classes. And so we're covering classes as we're having classes. And so we have uh, hired three individuals to work full time just to substitute internally within the district. Uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of a, an overview of, of where we're at. Mrs. Spears had an issue going on and texted me shortly before nine and said she would not be able to attend today. And so, uh, uh, I'm kind of reporting in for both of us in that context, but I'd be willing to answer a couple of questions or field a question if there's one out there. Any questions, Keith? Michael, I'm just kind of curious how your staff is holding up and the, you know, are they, how their concerns are being, and I put this in light of what has been going on in Little Rock. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, are you seeing any of that or is that kind of isolated to Little Rock? 
Well, uh, you know, Little Rock is a very large district. What occurred there is they kind of had a sit out in the aspect of coming to work based on fear associated with health related concerns. The other thing that I would mention in a setting of that magnitude, it's very difficult to control student movement, staff movement, because you may be dealing with a high school that's got 2,500 students in it versus a high school that has 400. And roughly of that 400, only 280 of them are actually attending all day long. So our ability as a small school to kind of control the environment, uh, that's where a small school I think has an advantage over a larger school setting because uh, as a whole, we are managing a population of 1,300 students plus K-12 versus a Little Rock that could be dealing with 15,000 students. And so the variations and, and there's a, an element of unionization that exists there that maybe does not exist in a small school. But to address your question directly, I think that there's true mental anxiety for all teachers. Uh, it's not so much uh, with some, it is the element of protecting their own health and well-being, but for most, it's the magnitude of the workload. It's balancing in the element of time, uh, providing uh, detailed attention, and then uh, giving them the ample support to learn how to teach in a virtual environment is kind of where I'm challenged at this point. So I'm looking at some uh, external support to maybe Zoom with our teachers to help build quality virtual lessons because virtual instruction is not a mirror of on-site instruction. And that's what most people would think it would be initially is, is you just teach through the lens of a camera and you replicate. And when you choose to do that, the engagement is minimal. So it's really about pairing students in a virtual environment, doing a small group discussion with this group that we have here, pairing them to think about a topic and then report back out to the group. That's fundamentally different than whole group instruction through a virtual lens. So we're looking at ways to expand uh, this process and, and I'm really challenging our leadership to not look at this in the short term of survival but to look at this in the context of delivery long-term, because I do believe that as much as we want this pandemic to go away and we want things to be normal, uh, I think the role of education in society will shift upon conclusion of this pandemic. And so we've got to be prepared to deliver uh, on-site instruction, virtual instruction, and, and do it effectively, knowing full well our kids set out from March until the opening of the school year. And the one thing I observed is that the regression really went as deep as last Christmas. It wasn't that we just didn't deliver content, but when you put kids on a sideline and, and don't engage them from March the 10th through August the 25th, that regression measure, it's almost a half a year, not a fourth of a year that you didn't deliver. So. Uh, that's really another challenge our teachers are taking on, Keith, is they're trying to figure out how they conduct remediation and new content simultaneously and really narrow in because we just can't keep teaching if the students don't understand content that is applied to the next lesson. And so uh, really making us think deeper about mastery learning. Uh, the environment is stretched. And I don't know that it will ever, and maybe, you know, as much as we hate to say it, uh, maybe it's, it's time, you know, it's time to rethink how we deliver content instructionally. Um, where I said as a leader is, is the variable time. How do you control that? How do you organize it? Because uh, that's really the only thing teacher doesn't have and, and uh, control of. And so if we can restructure that time, we're kicking around a Friday for on-site instruction, but freeing up our um, teams of teachers that teach core content to actually have some time to attend to virtual students on that day and have Friday maybe look a little bit different than the other four days of the week, move our professional learning community into the Friday, have four days of the week that are just direct instruction, direct routine with our FACES program. Invariably, when you look at student attendance, you don't have 100% of the attendance in uh, five days a week. So uh, we're trying to see what we can do to uh, uh, help our teachers a little bit to use that time. So probably more than you wanted to know based on that, but that's kind of how we're trying to address teacher stress and really hear and listen to them, but also listen to parents because uh, 
you know, it, it's that balance of supporting both sides. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple other things that uh, I had on the agenda. One is, uh, you know, Dave is always looking for new speakers. Uh, excellent speakers today. I think it's a great idea to have uh, the chief come back and speak um, as well directly uh, on a separate occasion. But certainly, we need to continue to look at and get quality speakers. I think it's very important for folks here, you know, our members out here in the village, to see some of these folks. And I know I learned a lot from from today. So I'm sure others will see this video. Um, so we also have holdings in various areas. Uh, our county specifically, uh, we have someone representing our information, but our county uh, still somewhat of a challenge. Uh, Sam has uh, offered to take a legislative uh, so committee sets that are attacking some of our legislators. People like uh, Representative Rue, just to get a relationship with them, having to come out and speak to us by time, getting information about the city of the legislature and how it affects uh, the village, I think is important to say. I think everything that you, you could take on, uh, certainly can use some of those interventions uh, as well to start reaching out to those folks to, uh, you know, start just letting them know that we're interested in, we got some money behind we want them to work with them, you know, as well. And one thing on that, great, I think it's going to be a career about Charles, Jim, you going to have a bunch of good state folks. Uh, I don't know if their name. So we have to see if we can get Sam invited to Yeah, you know, yeah. Sam can be legislated and we can get him on that. Because I know this was something we were going to give you not to meet the folks to meet the county government and final decision was just to just get two hard schedules and just bring them all here. And you offer them a lot of yep. they, they, they'll come type of stuff. <laughs> so if you feed them, they will come. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, and I think also, David, you had mentioned about getting someone uh, to start participating with the Downtown Merchants Association and, or the Benton area as well. You're still looking for a volunteer for someone yes. to potentially pick up um, yes. a little of that as well. So uh, with uh, our current membership, we do now have a couple of openings, I think, available. So we'll start taking some nominations, you know, for people to join the committee. Anyone that's watching the video uh, that's interested in joining the Government Affairs Committee, uh, they can reach out to the POA, get an application, uh, and then we'll start evaluating for a couple of new members. We have a couple of applications already pending. Uh, we certainly welcome more uh, members to participate in the Government Affairs Committee. Uh, we did have one old business item, which was the charter revisions. Uh, we did have the meeting, a uh, special session with the POA board relative to the clarification letter that they sent us. Uh, I think there's going to be some kind of subsequent clarifications, but I haven't received anything relative to that. So at this point, I'm just going to table that until we hear further uh, from the POA board about <laughs> any potential charter revisions that need to be made. Uh, there weren't a lot of revisions necessarily uh, to our charter. Uh, since we don't really direct any POA employees, we're not kind of that kind of committee, but uh, we'll see what they come back with in terms of any other uh, charter revisions that they may deem we need to do in the future. Is there any other new business? Anyone else have any items they would like to add to the meeting today? No? Well, seeing that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close out this meeting. Our next meeting of the Government Affairs Committee will be on November the 6th, Friday, November the 6th at 9 a.m. Uh, I think we'll continue to do in-person and Zoom uh, for the foreseeable future. For anyone that wants to participate, they can participate online uh, as well. So with that, I adjourn this meeting and thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everybody.